400,000 feet above the Earth's surface, the space shuttle Columbia re-enters the atmosphere. Within moments, it'll be an erupting fireball. All seven astronauts will be dead. Look at the chunks coming off of it. Yeah. What the heck is that? I don't know. This film counts down the final 60 minutes of a catastrophe and human tragedy, both for those on board and those supporting them on the ground. What went wrong, and could anything have been done to save Colombia? February the 1st, 2003. 280 kilometers above the Earth. A team of NASA's top astronauts aboard the space shuttle Columbia prepare to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, the most dangerous maneuver of their 16-day mission. London, Paris, Tel Aviv, Moscow, Beijing, Vancouver, New York, then London again around the world in 90 minutes. Their shuttle blazing in its orbit at 28,000 kilometers per hour. The astronauts experience 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day. Now they must return to Earth. The hour leading up to Columbia's re-entry is a flurry of activity at John F. Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. The man who must bring Columbia back to Earth is Leroy Kane, flight director. Flight. Just 39, he has risen through the ranks of NASA thanks to his iron nerve. I'm a person who sort of thrives on pressure. It is a high stress environment. And if you don't thrive and perform well in that kind of environment, it's really not a good job for you to be in. Kane knows that the lives of seven astronauts lie in his and his team's hands. Fundamentally, the flight director is responsible for the safety and success of the, of the mission, the safety of the crew, and the safe return of the vehicle. Whether this is flight on the flight loop, how do we look for landing? The shuttle's unique design is critical to its success. Top NASA scientist G. Scott Hubbard was one of the brains behind it. The shuttle is a very, very complex system, probably the most complex flying machine humanity has ever built. It takes off like a rocket, it orbits like a spacecraft, it lands like an airplane. How do those targets look to you, Guidance? They look good, Flight. Kane heads up the mission operations team, which must decide collectively if conditions are right to bring the spacecraft safely to the ground. Flight Surgeon? The program essentially entrusts the mission operations team to execute the mission. They are entrusted with this crown jewel of, uh, of manned spaceflight to go execute the mission and do it safely and do it successfully and do everything within your ability to get the vehicle and the crew back at the end of, a, of, the, of the mission. So trust is huge. OK, getting ready for the deorbit burn here in a few minutes. How do those targets look to you, Guidance? No, I'm good. At 8.03 AM, Kane begins his checklist. OK, flight controllers, we are through step Bringing Columbia back into the atmosphere is the most dangerous part of the mission because re-entry exposes the shuttle to 1,500 degree heat. The first step to touchdown is the de-orbit burn, which means firing the shuttle's rockets to bring it into the Earth's atmosphere. The shuttle is computer-guided from mission control. It's up to Kane to check every system to make sure he can get the astronauts home alive. It's all systems go. When Kane gives the order, Columbia's rockets will fire, slow down, and leave orbit. Columbia Mission Commander Rick Husband has dedicated his life to being an astronaut. He told the press his ambition began early. 
When I was four years old and the Mercury Project first got started, I was in front of the TV for every one of the launches. And the whole time I was growing up, as long as I can remember, anytime anyone asked me what I wanted to be, it was, I want to be an astronaut. Canadian astronaut Julie Payette flew with Rick Husband on a previous shuttle mission. We were both rookies, uh, new guys on the block. Um, which is, you know, a particular bond, uh, because you experience this new thing, spaceflight, uh, together. Uh, Rick is the Texan from Amarillo and spoke with a very uh, distinctive Texan accent. It, it, it was a joy to fly and to have this experience with him. Capcom flight. We're go for the burn. They can perform the maneuver on time. Columbia, Houston, you're go for the burn and you can make the maneuver on time. Okay, Houston, go for the burn. How do we look for landing? Kane's team have never seen him flinch. Today, that'll change forever. Eight twelve a.m. The crew of the space shuttle Columbia prepares to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and begin descent to Cape Canaveral. They are scheduled to touch down in exactly one hour, four minutes. Check. OMS MPS system. Okay. Okay. So, what's the weather looking like in Florida? Weather conditions are sunny and clear, perfect for landing. They are NASA's best and brightest. Willie McCool, pilot. Kalpana Chawla, engineer. Michael Anderson, payload commander. Laurel Clark, zoologist. David Brown, flight surgeon. Ilan Ramon, electronics expert. Before liftoff, each of them made a statement to the press. It may be something which only a handful can do, but if you really like what you do, then you've never really lost anything. We have such a new and young crew, and we work together for so long that the relationship is something you don't quite understand. Do. I, never really I remember Gemini and Apollo quite late into the 60s, and then Skylab and the early shuttle. The shuttle had launched 16 days earlier. Columbia was the oldest of the fleet, and this was its 28th mission. Like landing, takeoff is a high-risk time for the spacecraft and its passengers. Commander Rick Husband, as he is currently in the White Room, our pilot, Willie McCool. Uh, this is his first flight. At launch, the Columbia weighs four and a half million pounds. Much of that weight is fuel, housed in an orange foam-covered tank directly under the shuttle. Basically, the Columbia is hardwired to a big bomb. Space exploration is a risky business. It is foolish for anyone who's in that arena to pretend to the public that there aren't significant challenges and that there aren't risks, including the risk of death and tragedy. The shuttle is a risky vehicle. It needs to be replaced. Back in 1986, the world had watched stupefied when the space shuttle Challenger turned into a fireball on takeoff. This terrible image scarred NASA's safety record. Almost two decades later, as Columbia launched, the fear of another disaster lingered. Columbia's mission had been delayed 13 times over two years because of technical snags. But at last, liftoff. Two, one, we have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. NASA had been under a lot of pressure to get Columbia into space after so many setbacks. When you're in a program 
that's got a lot of schedule pressure, a lot of budget pressure, a lot of performance requirements. The tendency that grew up over time was for you to get launch fever. Let's just go ahead and get this thing done, okay? We got the right stuff. The seconds which follow liftoff are the most dangerous for the mission as the shuttle fights to escape the Earth's gravity. The Columbia launch appeared to be a textbook success. Eight minutes later, the shuttle separated from the fuel tank. Now converging Columbia's onboard computers, commanding the main engine nozzles to gently swivel, aiming the shuttle for a precise target in space for main engine. And uh, they're getting ready to take a look outside the window. And, uh, the crew photographed the giant tank falling back to Earth. And we're looking at it through the overhead window. The shuttle was in orbit 300 kilometers above the Earth, racing at 28,000 kilometers per hour. For an astronaut, it's a breathtaking moment. The first free moment I have, I'm excited about just looking down at our planet and soaking it all in. This mission was for space research. The shuttle bay was fitted with a science lab to conduct experiments designed to help scientists learn about long-term survival in space. Where did we come from? Are we alone? Where are we going? What happens when a living system leaves the planet origin, leaves this Earth? The experiments ranged from tests on animals, fish and ants, to the study of weightlessness. I think it is critical for understanding how life works to understand the role of gravity. And if we're ever gonna take the probably three year trip to Mars with people, we have to learn a lot more about how you fix the problems that weightlessness creates. Despite all the training, nothing can prepare astronauts for the experience of zero gravity. In a quarter of a second, we just go from three times the heavier to, oh, why? You're still strapped into your seat, but you can tell you're already floating in it, and then stuff starts floating in the cabin. And then your brain says, whoa, nobody told me about this. What's this about? You take a look at this. One day after what had seemed a perfect launch, a team inspecting video footage discovered that a piece of foam cladding from the main fuel tank had come loose and hit the shuttle during liftoff. Whoa. Can you highlight it? Yeah, no problem. This was nothing new. The foam has to cover irregular areas on the surface of this external tank. It's a huge amount of acreage. I mean, you're covering hundreds and hundreds of square feet or square meters. The foam doesn't stick perfectly. And so every flight, literally every flight of the shuttle, some of it comes off. It was, in NASA speak, an in-family problem. Yeah. They called it popcorning. But this chunk was bigger than normal, the size of a 50-centimeter TV screen. It was clear from the video that the foam had hit the orbiter's left wing, but there had been foam hits before. No one was unduly worried. It was probably a day or not more than two days after we launched, and I had seen some video. At the time, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was foam. I didn't know if it had impacted the wing. I knew that the engineering teams were off looking at it to determine whether it was something that we needed to be or should be concerned about. 8.20 a.m., the countdown for Columbia's re-entry to the atmosphere is well advanced. But though the foam hit's been known about for two weeks, there's a consequence neither crew nor ground control are even now aware of. Two days into the flight, a piece of the leading edge of the left wing hit by the foam fell off. Unseen and unknown, 
there's a gaping hole in the shuttle's left wing. It went unnoticed at the time, because from the command capsule on the Columbia, the crew could not see the wings. And the computer systems on the shuttle were so primitive that the data from the wings' sensors could not be processed on board. Unlike Star Trek, or unlike a science fiction series, there is not aboard the shuttle some all-powerful computer that's analyzing thousands of inputs and telling the crew there's a problem. The shuttle is based in the technology of the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, the primitive computers that are on board, compared to your laptop, aren't hooked up to sensors, and even if they were, they're not capable of doing a lot of real-time analysis. The shuttle could easily orbit in space with an undetected hole in its wing, but it would not be able to return to the Earth's atmosphere. Blissfully unaware, the astronauts held a video conference with Earth and the International Space Station the day after the piece of wing fell off. Hey, Alpha, this is Columbia. How are you doing over there? We're doing great. We're so glad to see you guys made it into orbit. Yeah, we're glad to be here, too. Everybody's doing a great job, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you guys. One space lab to another big old space lab. The evidence of the foam hit was brought to Columbia's mission manager, Linda Hamm, who'd had 16 years' experience in the job. She had to decide what action, if any, should be taken. The big question was, whether the hit had merely damaged the tiles on the outside of the wing, or whether there might be burn through to the panels of the wing itself. She chaired a series of conference calls with NASA engineers about the potential danger. Okay, uh, we received the data from the uh, systems integration guys of the uh, potential ranges of sizes and impact angles and uh, where it might have hit, but uh, the thermal analysis does not indicate that there is a potential for a burn through. No burn through means no catastrophic damage, and localized heating damage would mean a tile replacement? Well, it, it would mean possible impact to turn around repairs and that sort of thing, but we don't see uh, any kind of uh, safety of flight issue here. That again. The message from the NASA technicians was clear. They saw no reason to be alarmed, just the inconvenience of a longer turnaround before the next flight. What do you think? No safety of flight, no issue for this mission, nothing we're going to have to do different. There might be a turnaround. Right, right. Although we could have some significant tile damage here, we don't see a safety of flight issue. Would be a, a turnaround issue only. Right. We would get vehicles back on the runway and have lots of damage uh, of this type to the, to the uh, heat shield the, uh, tiles in the thermal protection system. And so we had a lot of experience with dings and, and nicks and, and chunks out of tiles that turned out to be a reuse issue. And so um, that's what I ha had understood this to be. Um, and so I didn't have any concerns as we entered into the preparations for deorbit and entry and landing. Anxious to avoid any awkward questions from the press, engineer Steve Stitch informed Commander Rick Husband of the problem. Hey, Rick. Yeah, Steve. There's uh, one item I'd like to bring to your attention. The item is not even worth mentioning, other than wanting to make sure you're not surprised by it in a question from a reporter. During ascent, at approximately 80 seconds, photoanalysis shows some debris impacted the orbiter left wing. Experts have reviewed the high-speed photography, and there's no concern. We have seen this same phenomenon on several other flights, and there's absolutely no concern for entry. Thanks for letting me know. I've seen this happen. Look, can you get the video up to me so I can have a look and then I'll show it to my crew? Sure thing. Safe ride home. Thanks, Steve. Keep up the good work. Columbia, out. NASA uplinked the tape to the shuttle. Rick Husband showed it to the crew. No one was alarmed. They all knew it had happened before. But some NASA engineers thought that not enough had been done to establish whether the foam hit had damaged the wing. 
They requested that the US Air Force use a spy satellite to get images of the orbiter in space. No, I don't believe it. Linda Hamm and the mission management team did not seek Department of Defense photographs of the shuttle. Later, they said that they had received no formal request. That is why I do go. However, there were residual concerns among the engineers on the ground. Discussions among the management team now focused on what do. they could do if the foam had it's indeed really pierced the wing. during the flight because there's not much we can do about yeah, it. Yeah, as everybody knows, we uh, took a hit on the left, uh, somewhere on the left wing leading edge. And uh, uh, we are also talking about what you can do in the event that uh, we do have some damage there. Right, okay. So we ought to pull... Linda out. Hamm asked for comparisons to be made with previous shuttle flights. Uh, the data from 112 or whatever the flight was, just to make sure. Yeah, and, and we'll do that. Then Hamm delivered an explicit admission. NASA was helpless. You know, I'm really... I really don't think there's much we can do. So it's not really a factor with this flight because there's nothing we can do about it. Okay. NASA management had five separate meetings about the foam strike. Flight director Leroy Kane recalls that every time it was on the agenda, the outcome was the same. No action needed. Subject. Help with debris hit. The space shuttle program was asked directly if they had any interest or desire in requesting resources outside of NASA to view the orbiter. They said no. After talking to Phil, I consider it to be a dead issue. Two days before their scheduled return to Earth, husband McCool and Chowla ran a complete simulation for re-entry. Husband and his team were confident. The Columbia was technically ready for touchdown at Cape Canaveral at 9.16 on February the 1st. No one on board the shuttle or on Earth had any idea that there was a gaping hole in Columbia's left wing and the astronauts were doomed. Just over half an hour from their scheduled touchdown, all systems seemed perfectly normal on the space shuttle Columbia. In mission control, flight director Leroy Kane feels total calm. It was right by the numbers, as I recall. And then we worked uh, with the crew through the post-burn checklist. There was nothing out of the norm, everything was, was going really well. The systems were all performing very well. The, the, the team was, was really um, on top of its game that day. How do we look for landing? Two minutes later, Columbia enters the discernible atmosphere, 400,000 feet above the Earth's surface. The utter cold of space gives way to intense heat on Columbia's hull. Right on cue, the temperature of the shuttle's wing soars to 1,400 degrees Celsius. Unknown to anyone, the superheated air starts to enter the wing through the undetected hole. Rick Husband and Willie McCall start the re-entry procedure. It is completely computer controlled. Once re-entry begins, there's no turning back. Columbia slows by 800 kilometers per hour, still traveling faster than any object ever created by man. This is the danger zone, losing speed and catching air. You have to go from 17,000 miles an hour to zero, sitting on a runway somewhere, in the span of just a few minutes. That means that you have to give up a huge amount of energy 
in a short period of time, that translates into a lot of heat. Inside the command capsule, the astronauts stare in awe at the raging heat outside the glowing windows. This is amazing. It's really getting uh, really bright out there. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now. <laughs> they have seen it before, but it never ceases to amaze. In Mission Control, the weather, not the wing, is on Flight Director Leroy Kane's mind. The winds are high at Cape Canaveral this morning. Kane's thinking about sending Columbia around for another orbit. At the last minute, he decides conditions are within the margin of safety. He gives approval for the planned touchdown in Florida. There is just one anomaly. A sensor on the left wing shows the leading edge is 1,650 degrees, 500 degrees hotter than ever recorded on a shuttle re-entry. At mission control, technicians are puzzled by the unexplained temperatures. FYI, I've just lost four separate temperature transducers on the left-hand side of the vehicle. Hydraulic return temperatures, uh, two of them in system one and one each in systems two and three. And the mechanical systems officer called me and said that uh, we were seeing indications of some uh, temperature um, sensors that were um, off nominal, and they were sensors that were in the back of the, of the uh, wing um, near the control surfaces. These high temperatures are coming from the landing gear area of the left wing. If anything has gone wrong with the shuttle's landing gear, Leroy Kane knows the shuttle can't land. Not funny. Four hide return temps to the left outboard and inboard elevons. The technicians struggle to interpret the data coming in from the shuttle's hydraulics. NDM or anything at all? I mean, you're telling me you lost them at exactly the same time? Oh, no, not exactly. They were within probably four or five seconds of each other. Where's that instrumentation located? They are located on the aft part of the left wing, right in front of the elevon. Copy. Kane tries to make sense of the temperature data coming from the left wing. There was no bus, no, no cable, no MDM, no single thing that was common to all of those measurements, um, except the fact that they were all in the left wing. That, that was the commonality, as it turns out. Right on schedule, the shuttle executes a computer-controlled roll to the right. The maneuver is designed to try to find some lift, which will help slow the shuttle down even more and cool her superheated outer skin. The shuttle is still doing everything that it's supposed to. Kane reassures himself the problem with the sensors on the left wing is a computer error. Copy. We began to look around the room and ask the other team members, hey, how's it look? Everything's going fine. And the reason everything else was working fine is because the orbiter was continuing to fly fine. All of the rest of the systems were continuing to function normally. Columbia seems to be performing perfectly. What no one realizes is that the breach in the left wing is pushing the thrusters into overdrive to compensate. We know now it was firing continuously in order to correct for the wing with the hole in it that was starting to disintegrate. The shuttle is now heading towards Earth at a speed of 17,000 kilometers per hour. At mission control, Kane's team monitor the descent. Everything looked good to you? Control and rates and everything is nominal, right? Control's been stable through the rolls we've gone through so far, flight. We have good trims. I don't see anything out of the ordinary. All other indications for your hydraulic systems indications are good? They're all good. Uh, we've had good quantities all the way across. And the other temps are normal? They're all normal. Yes, sir. In the cockpit, the temperatures are still reading normal. Kane has nothing to tell the crew. If there's something we want the crew to do or need the crew to do, we give them the direction to do that. In this case, we didn't have anything figured out by the time we lost comm with the crew. Right on schedule, the computer kicks in once more. 
and Columbia executes a roll reversal, another maneuver to slow the vessel's re-entry speed. And once again, the shuttle performs perfectly. Wing temperatures even begin to drop exactly as planned, despite the damage. But readings on Columbia's hydraulic systems on the left wing are still going haywire. We see it out the front also. Max, tell me again which system's there for. Uh, that's all three hydraulic systems. These extreme readings present a puzzle no one has well, planned for. The left outboard elevon and two in the left inboard. Okay. I got you. And when you say you lost those, are you saying they went to zero or off scale low? All four of them are off scale low. And they were staggered. They were, like I said, within seconds of each other. In Arizona, a group of shuttle watchers get up early to take home videos of the famed Columbia. There's seven people in that thing. Wow. Look at the chunks coming off of it. Yeah. What the heck is that? I don't know, but I see what you're saying. Ooh. Ice, maybe? The crew on board Columbia are still totally unaware that there is any problem. They cannot see the disintegrating wing. The Columbia should now be visible to NASA tracking stations, but there is no sign of it. Because I asked the flight dynamics officer to verify that the systems were working the way they were supposed to, and he verified that they had been checked, and they double-checked, and they just checked them again, and they're working, and they're not they seeing the stuck. orbiter like in the space and time where it's supposed to be. At that point, I pretty much felt like we probably had a significant problem that we may not be able to recover from. Although I still didn't, I still wasn't ready to, to acquiesce to that. A huge piece of thermal tile flies off the shuttle. It will be the first piece of Columbia found on the ground by investigators. What was that? I don't know. The shuttle is now uncontrollable. Please respond. Then, a new problem from the systems tech in mission control. We just lost tire pressure on the left outboard and left inboard. Both tires. Copy. Kane's calm answer masks his confusion. Columbia, this is Houston. Please respond. Losing tire pressure means the Columbia will crash on touchdown. The loss of tire pressure is detected in the cockpit. Pressure on left outboard and left inboard, both tires. Rick Husband tries to reach mission control. These are his final recorded words. Our flight max tires are also off the off Columbia, this is Houston. Please respond. Columbia, this is Houston. Please respond. Flight, there's still no response from Columbia. Copy. Leroy Kane's mind flashes back to the foam impact. He knows the unthinkable has happened. That NASA has made mistakes that have cost lives. I can probably even show you, if you have the mission control video, where, where that thought was going through my mind. Final one, you expecting tracking? One minute to go, flight. Columbia, Houston, UHF, comm check. Uh, the orbiter may have started flipping around, it may have started tumbling, we're not really sure, 
but it was not instantaneous. There was a period of time in there when the crew probably knew that the end was near. At 9 a.m., the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrates. The flagship of the fleet, a screaming fireball over the desert. GC flight. Fly GC. Lock the doors. Copy. Mission control is now like a crime scene that must not be contaminated. Everything in the room is vital evidence. I, I just wanted to make sure that, that, number one, folks understood that, again, um, stay focused on the task here. Let's um, stay within ourselves and stay within the system and, and keep doing what we know and understand how to do until we know more. And, uh, and that's when I asked him to lock the doors. Seven men and women have died on Leroy Kane's watch. Marty, can you confirm that the uh, DDS, DDMS folks uh, in the Dallas area have been mobilized to the extent we're able to? Yeah, Rescue Coordination Center is mobilizing to that area. These were people that I knew, that I cared about. They were part of my, uh, certainly part of my work family, and, and uh, these are people that my kids and my wife knew and had relationships with. Um, he was part of our family, and uh, it was difficult to think about the, the fact that we may have just lost him. Dallas TV News shows home video of the disaster before NASA's computers positively confirm it. Now it's up to investigators to determine what went wrong and who is to blame. Seven astronauts on the space shuttle Columbia are dead. Their mission was almost complete, and we lost them so close to home. The men and women of the Columbia had journeyed more than six million miles and were minutes away from arrival and reunion. The catastrophe that has resulted in a deadly fireball over Texas is one of NASA's worst failures. Hours after the disaster, NASA calls upon a retired Navy admiral with no axe to grind to conduct an inquiry. We are going to work uh, with uh, the NASA officials. Who are Al Gaiman starts to pick through the evidence. The investigation centers around the issue of the foam hit. Could mere foam have caused such a devastating breach? After five months of debate and speculation, they rig up a test. We fired a 1.7 pound piece of foam at about 500 miles an hour at the lower part of panel number eight that had been taken off one of the other orbiters. So it had a flight history just exactly, or as close as we could, to that of Columbia. We fired that piece of foam, and it blew a hole 16 inches in diameter. There was a audible gasp from the crowd. The astronauts who were with me, one of them said, so this is what really happened. It was clear that the speed of the hit had transformed the lightweight foam into a deadly missile. At 82 seconds after launch, the shuttle is moving very fast, more than two and a half times the speed of sound. When the foam fell off, it began to slow down because it is very light. The difference in the speed of the foam and the speed of the shuttle at that point was about 500 miles an hour. So in a sense, the shuttle ran into the foam. There was now no doubt what caused the tragedy. 
Instead of a period behind our findings, we had an exclamation mark. When Gaiman's report came out, heads rolled at NASA. In particular, he criticized the organization in its poor communication and casual risk assessment. Process that we follow at all of our press conferences, I have a uh, short... I mean, the shuttle state. program management was unsafe. They couldn't manage anything safely. I mean, they couldn't manage a bus line safely, much less a shuttle, because of the way they were organized. Three top managers were removed from the shuttle program. There are some people who did the wrong things. They conducted serious discussions in the hallway. They didn't request detailed information. They made decisions based on flawed thinking. It didn't hurt me yesterday, it won't hurt me today. And those individuals now are no longer part of the program. The ground team broke its covenant with the astronauts. That, that covenant is that uh, when we put you up in space and while you're up in space, we will do everything we possibly can to ensure your safe return. And that they did not do everything that they could to ensure the safe return of the Columbia. But could anything have been done to save the lives of the seven astronauts aboard Columbia? There was no onboard toolkit, so a repair would have been impossible. Scientist G. Scott Hubbard thinks a rescue could have been attempted. This country has done incredible things to rescue people over the years. It would undoubtedly have been a decision at the highest levels to pursue this, because what if the next orbiter had the same foam problem? And on launch, another hole was created. You would have to weigh a huge set of contingencies and problems and issues against each other. But the answer we came up with was, it is in principle possible for a rescue mission. Since the Columbia disaster, astronauts do mandatory spacewalks to inspect the shuttle's hull for damage, as well as a video inspection. If they find damage, there is now a toolbox aboard to fix basic problems. For the seven aboard the Columbia on the 1st of February 2003, these reforms came too late. The whole time I was growing up, as long as I can remember, any time anyone asked me what I wanted to be, it was, I want to be an astronaut. And when you talk to these people who are pretty old today, and you tell them that you're going to be in space, they look at you as a dream that they could never have dreamed of. There's always the potential for something going wrong. You know, we try not to think about those things. Leroy Kane remains a top NASA flight operative. He believes that if he or the crew had known about the hole in the wing, it would have been worse. The end for the seven astronauts was at least mercifully quick. The difference would have been that we on the ground and the crew on board would have known. Um, and that, that, of course, would have, would have been uh, maybe even unbearable for some of us.